Thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Uh, can I apologise right at the start for my slightly dishevelled appearance this morning? Some of you may have noticed I hadn't ironed my shirt. Um, that's because I was in my hotel this morning. I got up, turned the iron on before I hopped in the shower, and the whole place exploded and went black. Um, so I did everything in the dark this morning and couldn't iron my shirt. So it's not because I'm some hick from Invercargill. It's just I had no, no iron. Um, as Liz said, I have long had an interest in social finance, social investment, um, possibly because I'm one of those people that come from the dark side. Um, I've been at the Community Trust of Southland for about 18 years, but prior to that I was in public practice, chartered accountancy and banking and corporate receivership. So I had a corporate financial side before the philanthropic interest and so I've always had an interest in that middle ground between philanthropy and capitalism I suppose um, and how can we as philanthropic funders use not only the grants from our income statement but how can we use the power that resides in our balance sheet for community good as well. And I was looking for a slide that captured that and I found one courtesy of Kate Frickberg um, from some work Kate did in this area two or three years ago. And I don't know if you can read that, but on the right hand side it talks about traditional grants, which is where philanthropists traditionally live. They, the majority of their activity is making grants, money in, money out that David talked about, um, and some longer term grants as well through to, at the other end, a traditional investment portfolio, which is the balance sheet side of our businesses. Um, and on the balance sheet, you're looking for financial return only. The granting side, you're looking for social return only. But in that middle ground between those two poles, there is quite fertile ground, I think, for thinking about how we can use both of those levers at the right time in the right place to affect social good and community good. So for a long time our trust has been involved in making social loans. We don't make it a lot. We, last year we made 832 grants and we approved two loans. So it's a very small part of what we do but it's a useful tool to have on the toolbox. We also, um, mission related equities and bonds is the other one in there. Um, and we do some of that. We have our own private equity company the Community Trust of Southland exists to benefit Southland and so we have a private equity company that invests only in Southland businesses and takes shareholding in local businesses to make a financial return so it satisfies the balance sheet test but also to try and achieve some community good, economic good for the region on the way through. So that middle ground is quite fertile ground I think and so that was why earlier this year um, given that long interest that I've had I went to the UK as Liz said, on a Churchill Fellowship to have a look at social finance. So David was introduced this morning as an expert in social finance and he very quickly put us right on that and he said he was an explorer. I'm neither an expert nor an explorer, I'm just a tourist really. Um, I just went to have a look. Um, and what I'm going to show you isn't sort of snaps from my holiday or anything like that, but it's I spent uh, a couple of weeks looking at that well, more than a couple of weeks, four weeks actually, looking in that particular mission-related investing, social finance, social investment space in the UK. And so I visited a lot of the infrastructural organisations, many of which David has already told you about. So I went and met with Triodos Bank in Bristol, um, and they described themselves, interestingly, as a socially useful bank, which I'm not sure what that says about the other banks, but <laughs> that's how they describe themselves, that they exist to make a financial return, but also to do good for the community along the way. Um, I met with Nick O'Donoghue, the CEO of Big Society Capital, to find out what they do. Big Society Capital got their capital from government and the major banks in the UK, from dormant bank accounts. And they're going to have, I think, David, £800 million, £600 million from those sources um, to make social investments in the UK. Also met with um, Social Finance, which is a private consultancy company. Some of you may have heard, some of you that are aware of social impact bonds may have heard of the Peterborough 
prison social impact bond. That's where that came from, was from Social Finance Limited in the UK. So I went and met with them and talked to them about the, the Peterborough prison bond. Um, social Investment Scotland. So I ventured north to Edinburgh and to Glasgow, and I think I heard a Scottish accent over in the corner there. I recognise them now. Um, they are like a big society capital, but smaller, a shrunken down version. So they have capital to invest in social ventures in Scotland. And the, the final infrastructural organisation I went to was Charities Aid Foundation. They also have a charity, a charity bank, um, so take deposits and make loans for social purposes, community purposes. Also have a venture capital social fund as well. So they were the, the infrastructure ones I went to. And then I also visited 15 trusts and foundations throughout the UK and three in the USA as well. And I wanted to talk to them about their involvement in social finance. Did any of them actually invest in social investments? Or were they purely grant makers on one side and they use their balance sheet for traditional financial return only investments? And I was pleasantly surprised, well not surprised, but of the 15 that I visited, and there's a whole range there, I mean Esme Fairbairn's the largest foundation in the UK, they give away just under, well they have assets of about a billion pound. Um, the MacArthur Foundation in the state, six billion dollar trust, so there's some big ones, and then some little ones. The Queen's Trust, I wanted to go to the Queen's Trust because their office is at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and I thought that would be quite a cool place to go for a meeting. So I contacted them and arranged to go and meet with them. And then a couple of days before I got there, they emailed me and said that we wouldn't be meeting at the palace any longer, that we'd meet in some scungy cafe in Piccadilly. <laughs> uh, so, but they're a smaller trust. They've got about 21 million pounds. And they're quite interesting. We think we've got strategic planning challenges in some of our trusts. Their strategic challenge at the moment is they want to wind the trust down and they want to spend their last pound at the same time the Queen does if you know what I mean. Uh, she know that? <laughs> and I don't know that they've told her this or not, <laughs> but 2021 they're aiming to spend their last pound. Um, so a whole range of trusts and foundations. And of those 15, 10 of them were involved in social investment, social finance in some form or other, whether it was a social loan or mission-based investing or a social impact bond. A lot of them were involved in social impact bonds and had invested in social impact bonds. So what I'm going to talk about is just some observations from meeting those people and then trying to think about, well, what relevance has that got for the New Zealand marketplace and the New Zealand environment? Um, so 10 observations. But an observation before I left home, I guess, because that's New Zealand rather than the UK, thinking about social services particularly, um, I often think that as grant makers, we fund social service providers that are battling here in the rapids, in the white water rapids of symptoms of social problems. And what it seems to me that government, particularly at the moment, is trying to do is to mobilise some capital to move upstream, to look at the causes. and so. Bill English and John Key, I think, are prospecting up the top of the hill there at the source of the water that's flowing down the river. Th what are some of the causes of those social issues? And what they'd like to do, I think, is move some of the capital from there upstream, but they can't afford to do both because it's going to take a long time to address some of the really gnarly social issues that we have. And in the meantime, there's going to be water continuing to flow downstream in the term, and so symptoms are still going to be there needing to be dealt with. And so there's this desire to find some new forms of capital to invest in the social services sector in New Zealand. And that's where this interest in social impact bonds um, has partially arisen from, I think. And a number of you will be familiar with social impact bonds. I won't go into the detail of it, because also because I'm only a tourist and not an expert. Um, but social impact bonds essentially are looking at bringing in new capital and it says they're private investors, it could well be philanthropic investors as well. And I'm sure philanthropic investors are being targeted. Um, to try and address a social issue that's been identified, and it has to be a very measurable social issue. And what the government would do 
is they will give a contract through an intermediary for a service and, and funded or financed by private investment or philanthropic investment for the service provider to do its intervention over however long they're contracted to do it and it, it's probably going to be more than a year but it might be three or four years. Uh, if they're successful and they achieve the outcomes that are prescribed and agreed and contracted to, the government pays a performance payment which you would expect would be the capital returned to the investor plus some return for success. Um, so that's the, the theory of it. In New Zealand at the moment there's a pilot going on which some of you will be aware of. Led by the Ministry of Health are piloting these social impact bonds in New Zealand. Uh, the ANZ is the intermediary and the WISE group is the, the service provider. Um, I don't know yet because they're still in the procurement phase, I think, but I'm not sure just um, who or if they've got their full complement of investors yet. But that's the pilot model that's been put together in New Zealand to test this social impact bond. So David alluded to there's quite a bit of hype and hyperbole and almost hysteria and, and quite a lot of hot air, I think, around social impact bonds. Um, you would think everyone was doing them with some of the talk that's around. And I guess that's one of the observations I've made or would make is that they are still very, very embryonic. And I noticed David used the same word. The Stanford Social Innovation Review this month in their edition on the front page, they've got a story, the payoff of pay for success. In the States, they call social impact bonds pay for success contracts. So it's the same thing. But it's interesting reading through that article the first social impact bond launched in the UK in 2010, which was the Peterborough Prison one. Uh, in the US, a couple of years later, 2012, there's only a small number, 15 in the UK, 7 in the US, and one underway here being piloted, the one that I just talked about. Globally, $200 million US has been invested in social impact bonds, which is nothing. Um, and Liz talked about the social finance, social investment market perhaps become, becoming a $500 billion market. This is a tiny part of that market. Uh, it is very, very embryonic. And there's a lot of poking and prodding and testing this model to see if it's everything it's cracked up to be. And my observation would be that it has got some merits um, and it's got some value as one tool in the toolbox, but it's only one small spanner in the, the much bigger toolbox of funding and financing options that are available to us as philanthropic grantors and philanthropic or social investors, if you like. Um, I find it interesting that they call them social impact bonds because they're not bonds at all. They're more equity-like or even venture capital-like. There is significant risk in social impact bonds. I think of a bond and I think almost risk-free and guaranteed to get your capital back. Um, Social impact bonds are at the other end of the risk spectrum in terms of the financial risk. Uh, there's no guarantee that you get your capital back in all of these bonds. The service provider risk, um, that it, it is totally dependent on the performance of the service provider. There is the measurement risk. Uh, can you measure it accurately? And there's the political risk as well, that um, if the political environment were to change, then social impact bonds could change as well. And we saw a bit of that in the UK. Um, so while they're called social impact bonds, I don't actually think of them as bonds in, in a portfolio of investments. They're more equity or, or venture capital almost. Um, David alluded to this. There is a significant infrastructure that has developed and evolved in the UK to support social investment. And we don't have that same breadth of infrastructure here in New Zealand or anything like it and I guess, I guess the question I came away with was do we actually need to try and build our own infrastructure here or are there bits from offshore that we can use? So might Triodos Bank look at operating in New Zealand? Um, big society capital, we, they wouldn't come here because it's UK capital but maybe there's a place for 
an equivalent in New Zealand. Um, so there is a significant infrastructure there that supports social investment in the UK that we don't have here. We had Prometheus Finance for a number of years, which sadly ended last year. I mean, they couldn't get the capital that they needed to grow. Um, so they would be the equivalent of Triodos Bank, a social bank, but it's no longer here. So there are some bits of our jigsaw puzzle that aren't quite in place yet. Um, and I think it's worth exploring which of some of those entities or in Australia, uh, they can do some things well over there, um, or Canada or other jurisdictions, Europe, can we encourage to operate here in New Zealand rather than trying to build our own because we're only a tiny country and a tiny market. Which brings me neatly on to the comment that not everything's a market. Um, social impact investing is a part of the financial solution to um, solving or addressing or mitigating social issues, but the great majority of the finance that's needed is going to continue to be grant funding, I expect. Um, and David's made some comments about sort of the granting practices uh, from the UK, and I saw a few of us, and I was one of them sort of squirming when he was talking about some of those, because I'm sure the same thing happens here. Um, but granting is still going to be, and is always going to be, the, the majority of what we do. But I think there is a place for social investment using your balance sheet where you can. The question before about capability of organisations, it's all very well to try and build a social investment and social investors in New Zealand, but there has to be something to invest in. So there needs to, oops, there needs to be a demand side as well. There need to be social enterprises that are fundable and bankable and investable. And I'm sure there are some, but there needs to be more, I think, if we're going to see growth in the social investment, social finance market in New Zealand. So it's a supply and demand. Government is important in all this, and David alluded to that too, about the role of government being, you say, a help and a horror at the same time. Um, and they can be, but they've got a really important role to play in the development of a social finance, social investment market in New Zealand. Um, and we've seen how supportive government in the UK has been to growing that market. And the same thing would need to happen here, and is happening here to a degree, but government has a few roles. And just to put that into context, that's giving New Zealand, philanthropy New Zealand's research from 2011, and that little pie there is $2.73 billion worth of philanthropic giving in New Zealand in 2011, which is quite a lot of money. It's 1.35% of our GDP, I think. Um, so that's how much gets given away each year, and philanthropy New Zealand are about to launch very soon, in December, giving New Zealand 2014, it will be, won't it? So how much, was, how much was given away last year in New Zealand? And hopefully it's more than that. So that's, that's how much philanthropy spends, if you like, across the whole spectrum of community. Government, that's just on social services, $27 billion a year. A lot of it money in, money out. Um, very little of that in an investment structure, it's mostly in a contractual structure. Um, so that's an awful lot of money. So one of the roles of government is as a provider or purchaser. So if you think of that social impact bond model, they would be a purchaser. There's been a suggestion in an article I saw earlier this year that ph philanthropy or philanthropic trusts and foundations could also be a commissioner of social impact bonds as well as or instead of government, and that's an interesting concept to think about. I'm just not convinced about that, um, but I haven't thought about it too much. But government has a big role to play as a purchaser, but they have lots of roles as an enabler as well of the whole ecosystem of social finance in New Zealand. So to help build it, can we have a, a big society capital equivalent, please? It doesn't have to be 800 million pound or 600 million pound, but several million dollars would be quite good to, to seed that sort of investment. Um, should we try and get a foreign social bank to come and operate here? 
are government departments ready and coordinated to participate? So at the moment, the Ministry of Health is the lead agency for social impact bonds. They're piloting social impact bonds. What they did in the UK was set up an office of government that coordinates all of the social impact investing across government departments. And perhaps that's a role for Treasury here in New Zealand to be the one-stop shop and to make sure that the expertise around social impact bond investing and commissioning is strong across government because otherwise it'll just be led by individuals that have an interest in it and you'll get a very patchy performance of government and potentially opportunities that might exist in some of those departments and ministries won't be taken up because some people won't be aware of social impact bonds for a start. Um, data is a big issue and Bill English has been talking about this a lot lately. lately. Government has huge data sources uh, which can be anonymised and made available for investors, for service providers, um, and that would be a useful contribution to make, and they're starting to do that increasingly. I uh, talked about the supply side and the demand side, and government also has to navigate the politics in this. Um, that there needs to be a sure regulatory environment and legislative environment and a stable one if they hope to attract long-term investors into it. And if it chops and changes with political comings and goings, then that's going to be problematic to the market. It's a good thing they're doing the social impact bond pilot, I think, that they're testing the water and giving it an opportunity to see if this concept can work in the New Zealand context. Um, legislation and regulation is important too. Uh, in the UK they have this community interest companies structure that we don't have here. We have our charities structure, <coughs> which can be restrictive um, from a granting perspective particularly. If you're a charitable grantor and you're registered as a charity, you can only make grants generally to charities. Whereas community interest companies have a wider ambit um, and it's a bit more comfortable investing and, and supporting them. Trust deeds. Increasingly, it seems to me, social services and other services in New Zealand, which have traditionally been the preserve of not-for-profit organisations in terms of the deliverer of social services. So generally, it's either been government delivering social services directly or they've contracted the not-for-profit sector, NGOs, to deliver social services. Increasingly, I think we're going to see a trend of for-profit companies coming into that space. And social investment and social finance will encourage that, I think. And so I was looking at our trustee at the Community Trust of Southland the other day, and we can, we've got a very broad trustee. We can make grants for cultural, charitable, recreational, philanthropic, or other purposes that are beneficial to the community. So a very permissive trustee. The only problem with it is, in this context, it also says, but you can't make grants to for-profit organisations. And I've been thinking about that in the context of social investment um, and delivery of social services, and I'm thinking, well, does it matter actually who's delivering it, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit? As a philanthropic funder, shouldn't we be interested in the outcome? And that's what we're buying, irrespective of who's delivering it. So I think there, and that change is starting to, to come into New Zealand, I think. And so things like trustees need to be aligned to make sure that we can, we have got the full array of tools open to us. And the other one, unintended consequences, I guess, the, the anti-money laundering legislation and the financial service providers legislation, the joys of that legislation, um, bought in post-GFC and post-finance company meltdowns, and I think unintentionally, but an organisation like the Community Trust of Southland becomes ensnared in that legislation if we make loans. And I mentioned before we make two loans a year, maybe three sometimes in a big year. So we're not a big lender, but it's a useful tool. But we are caught under those pieces of legislation. And so four years ago, we applied to the Ministry of Justice and the Department of Internal Affairs for an exemption from that. And I'm expecting an answer any day. Um, <laughs> it'll be bloody great, actually, to find out. I mean, literally four years, which is just a nonsense. But it's that sort of stuff that they need to get rid of some of that bureaucratic clutter and, do, and get stuff done. So that, I mean, that's quite a, a disincentive f 
for a funder like us to invest in the social investment market. And I think if one part of government, the Ministry of Health, is piloting social impact bonds, trying to encourage social investment, it's beholden on the rest of government to at least do their bit to make sure that they get any roadblocks out of the road. Um, so that's just a pet gripe of mine that I've been on about for four years now, but hopefully not much longer. Um, investment advisors, I put that picture up because there's a few in the room. <laughs> George, and I, Russell's here somewhere. Where's Russell? There he is. Yeah. Uh, and Michael Chamberlain's not here, but he's our investment advisor, so I thought I'd better put him in. Um, they have to be convinced, and quite rightly they have to be convinced. If they've got a client who's interested in making a social investment, then the first thing that client is generally going to have to do is get the support of the investment advisor to say, yeah, that's a bona fide thing for you to do. So they, and it's, it's pleasing to see Russell and George here today, actually, and obviously interested in this space. Um, and it may take quite some time, I expect, to convince the investment advisory ad industry that social impact bonds particularly are a bona fide way for trusts and foundations to invest. But that's right, I mean, that's their job, is to keep us safe from ourselves and to make sure we don't hear off down a pathway that's going to end us in court because we've done something in breach of our trust deed or we've invested in, in a way that hasn't met our fiduciary responsibilities. One of the advantages of saying at the start that I had 10 observations is that you know we're getting towards the end now. Um, <laughs> number nine, this is an issue that's come up about um, as a potential blockage to investment in social finance that unlike a lot of other countries, a significant chunk of New Zealand's philanthropic pools of capital are regionally based. So in the UK, I think it's about 25% of uh, philanthropic trusts and foundations are what I would call institutional foundations or institutionalised, like community trusts, energy trusts, licensing trusts, 75% family foundations and a lot of them nat nationwide they operate. In New Zealand it's the other way around, about 75% of New Zealand's trust and foundations are community owned, regionally owned, community trusts, licensing trusts, energy trusts, gaming trusts to a degree. And so you get this, um, and I'll use the community trusts to illustrate it, that's, there's 12 community trusts around New Zealand, that's our one, that's the pick of them. Um, <laughs> and we can only make grants for the benefit of the people that live in that region, in that, that lovely little red area there. Uh, and people say, well, you couldn't invest in a social impact bond because it's going to be delivering a social outcome in Auckland or Whakatane or somewhere. Well, they're quite right, we can't from our grants budget, but from our balance sheets we can. because. On the balance sheet side of our business, our world is our world, it's global. So we've got, in, we've got investments in Volkswagen, unfortunately, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but we don't make grants in Germany. Um, we've got investments in Australia, but we don't fund them from the grant side. But with our investment capital, we deploy that where we can get financial return. So we can use our balance sheet capital outside of our region, and we do. Most of our investments are outside of Southland. All of our granting is inside Southland. And so if we're investing in the centre of the universe there, <laughs> if we've got an investment, a social impact bond, say, or a social investment that's based in Southland and is delivering a social outcome exclusively in Southland within our area, if it's going to have a less than commercial financial return for us, we can accept that if the social return is sufficient to compensate for that. So we can cross-subsidise between our investing activities and our granting activities in our region. But we can't if the social outcome is out of our region even if it's partially out of our region, it's, it's difficult. Um, so, so we can't say, well, we're going to fund, we're going to invest in a social impact bond in Wellington, or even nationally it's problematic, actually. If it was to achieve a social outcome across the whole country, it would be difficult for us to invest in it. Uh, 
because we're only interested, it doesn't sound right, we're only allowed to be interested in the social outcome for Southland. So one way around that, I guess, might be some sort of national fund that social investors might invest in, just like a private equity fund or a whatever. Um, but we can't subsidise, there's no free lunch. If we're using part of our capital, um, someone's got to pay for it if we're getting less than market return. And what we do with social investments that we make in Southland, if they are generating less than um, our normal financial return, we pay for it from our grants budget. So we literally book a grant um, to offset, to put the value of the social. So if we have a loan, say of a million dollars to someone, and it's at no interest rate, and we'd normally expect to earn 7%, we'll charge a grant of 70,000 to our grants budget and reduce the amount that we've got available to make in grants by 70,000. So our capital is working all the time, whether it's employed at Volkswagen or in a social loan in Queenstown. It's got to it's got to pay its own way somehow. No, no. It's only if there's some concessionary. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's anticipating your question beautifully, actually. Um, on the right hand side, if we invest cap four million dollars, say, in a social investment in Southland. And, and our normal portfolio return, say it's 7%, and this only generates 4% return, we can accept that lesser return, but we've got to pay for it from our grants budget, so 120,000. And on the other side, we can't. Uh, so we can only invest if the investment, the social investment, is going to return at least market return, and probably more depending on the risk that's involved in, in any particular investment. And the last comment, don't invest philanthropically. Um, it worries me a little bit that people might be eyeing up philanthropic trusts and foundations as some sort of soft wussy investors in social impact bonds. And if we do that, all we do is compromise our ability to make grants on the other side of the business. So I think we have to look at investments. If we are going to look at social investment, we have to look at it through an investment lens and price all the costs and all the benefits and make sure that we're accounting for it appropriately. And this is an example um, from the US and there's possibly something I've missed, but just on the face of it, they wanted to reduce recidivism in New York City, youth recidivism. And so they created a social impact bond and the cost was gonna be $9.6 million. Goldman Sachs invested $9.6 million, which is great. And their success, if, if they achieve the if the social service provider achieve the outcome, the state government in New York would pay Goldman Sachs eleven point seven million dollars, so a twenty two percent return, which is pretty good. Bloomberg Philanthropies guaranteed seven point two million dollars of Goldman Sachs investment. Does anyone know why? No, not I. <laughs> I'm sure there is a reason. <laughs> and he's running for president, I hear. But what they did, and I'm sure there is a good reason for it, but just on the face of it, uh, and I just use this just to illustrate the point that we can't think philanthropically if we're investing commercially. Goldman Sachs is getting a venture capital-like return for essentially a risk-free investment, because it's underwritten by the grant maker, and Bloomberg Philanthropies are getting less than a risk-free return. They were getting no return but they've taken on board venture capital type risk. So I couldn't quite understand. And I couldn't quite understand why <coughs> the philanthropic didn't make the investment themselves, actually. Because um, they're exposed to all the risk but none of the potential upside the way they did structure it. So, but I'm sure there will be a good reason which Michael Bloomberg will be able to explain. So that's it, really, 10 observations. Um, that potential for social impact bonds to move capital upstream and to bring in new capital to the social services space um, is one of the drivers, I think, of social impact bonds being the flavour of the month at the moment. And I think social Im impact, impact bonds are still very embryonic, but they're worth spending the time poking and prodding to see if they can work and testing them. And I do think it's a great thing that 
the pilots underway in New Zealand. Um, I don't really think they are bombs. Um, infrastructure support for social investment in New Zealand is something that needs to be built. And whether that's we DIY or we bring it in, or probably a combination of both of those things. Granting is still going to be a big part of what grant makers do, obviously. And the social investment is going to be a very small part, but I think an important and useful part. We need social investors and we need social enterprises with capability and fundability and bankability. Uh, government's role is critical in this. All the testing and poking and prodding around social investment, investment advisors at the end of the day are either the gateway to investment or the gatekeepers from investment. And so they quite rightly need to be convinced that this is a bona fide thing for investors to be contemplating. Um, the fact that there's a lot of regionalisation of philanthropy in New Zealand is a little bit of an impediment, but it's not the showstopper that I think some people might think it is. And philanthropic investors, I don't think, should be philanthropic with their investors. They need to look at it through the right lens. And that brings me to 12 o'clock, Liz. Well, so I'm finished. Very, very neatly yeah. to 12 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed.